The following episode is sponsored by Centec. Carbon dioxide is an integral parameter for brain and lung protection in neonatal patients. CO2 provides an indication of safe levels of cerebral blood flow, as well as the efficacy of ventilatory support for delicate lungs. Centec transcutaneous technology provides continuous, accurate, non-invasive monitoring of carbon dioxide, enabling visibility into patient ventilation status and helping to reduce the frequency of blood draws. Centec, care with confidence. Hello, and welcome to NANCAST. I'm Jill, your host. Carbon dioxide measurement is a fundamental evaluation in a NICU. As NICU nurses, we know that both high and low values of CO2 have detrimental effects on neonatal morbidity and mortality. It is essential that we maintain our CO2 at target levels, as these infants are vulnerable to brain and lung impairment. Not only are rapid changes in CO2 detrimental to infants, but the multiple blood draws place the infants at risk for poor neurodevelopmental outcomes, risk for infection, and increased risk of blood loss. What can we, as NICU nurses, do to avoid these outcomes while closely monitoring the CO2 levels? It is my pleasure to be joined with Chelsea Lee, NICU nurse and the International Clinical Education Manager at Centec, to discuss Centec's transcutaneous CO2 monitoring and all the benefits to not only our fragile patients, but the advantages of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring in guiding clinical decisions and prompt interventions. Let's get right into it. So Chelsea, tell us, for people that don't know, what is Centex transcutaneous technology? Yeah, so transcutaneous monitoring is basically a continuous and non-invasive measurement that's going to allow you as a clinician to see your CO2 value, as well as the trend over time. So the core piece of our system is a sensor that's, that we apply to the patient's skin. So this sensor is warmed, it's heated to about 41 degrees Celsius, and it gently heats that measurement site that you've chosen after you apply the sensor. This is going to help encourage the blood flow to your measurement site and the diffusion of gases across the skin and into the sensor. Um, On our sensor, we have a membrane and a specifically formulated electrolyte. And this is where the CO2 enters and there's a measurable reaction that occurs. And then that value is transmitted to our monitor where you then see an estimate of arterial CO2. So essentially you're seeing the CO2 value and then a trend as you continue to monitor over time. I know a lot of units use end titles to monitor CO2. So how um, does this compare to an end title CO2 monitoring? End title, I think, is an obvious choice sometimes because it's connected to the ventilator. It's usually easy to set up. It, it can be part of your, um, your setup when you go to intubate a patient. Um, it gives you that immediate Uh, indication whether or not you are in the trachea, um, but it also gives you a nice breath-to-breath waveform as you're monitoring. Um, But what we find in the NICU is that it's not really feasible for infants because of that small tidal volume, their higher respiratory rates, um, plus you're getting the added dead space in the system. So we really think that end-tidal CO2 is not the most viable option. It's going to most likely underestimate your CO2 value and not give you the correct trend over time. Yeah, I don't know how many times in different NICUs that I've worked in we'll try an end title and then compare that to a gas at the same time. And a lot of times they're very, uh, there's a huge discrepancy Mm -hmm. between our end title and our actual blood gas value. So, and that can be frustrating if, you know, if you're using those end titles as far as helping to manage your ventilation Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to getting those real good numbers from. Exactly. And I think another limitation that we're finding is that the more we move to these non-invasive forms of ventilation or focusing more on like oscillatory or jet ventilation, and title just really doesn't work as well. You get a lot of air mixing with the prongs or if your baby is breathing out of their mouth, that's going to kind of ruin your measurement in a way. So that's where end title does have its limitations. That's a very good point. I know a lot of NICUs are, are shying away from non are shying away from invasive mm-hmm. monitoring, um, as, and also ventilation. Many many kids that we would have intubated, um, a lot of our micropremies are now just getting NIPPV, CPAP, right, um, and that's a whole different ball game on how are we going to monitor their CO two. Yeah, because it, I mean. 
I feel like the monitoring, you just have to step it up so much more when they're so little and they're so, it feels like volatile in those first few days. Um, and to no longer have that invasive ventilation, yeah, it can be a little challenging. And that, you know, leads to the other challenge of now we have these micro preemies and we're having to stick them multiple times for ABGs if, if unfortunately we can't get, um, you know, uh, umbilical artery access. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's, not acceptable to to be, you know, um, having to expose those tiny babies to such stressful situations as um, an ABG. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can this transcutaneous monitoring overcome some of those challenges that we have with obtaining ABGs? To start off, I think it's important to know that transcutaneous monitoring is never going to replace your capillary or your ABGs. That's obviously a multi-parameter lab that we do need, but what it can help you do is cut down on the kind of unnecessary blood draws that you're doing just to check in on the CO2. So whereas the ABG or the capillary heel stick is going to give you that CO2 at that one point in time, the transcutaneous trend is going to give you the CO2 value over, you know, four hours, six hours, 12 hours. So you can really see how a patient's CO2 is fluctuating as you're making vent changes, as they're, you know, kind of laying there doing their thing, um, or maybe when you're doing a turn or trying to reposition them. Yeah, and I I think a lot of times physicians or the medical team gets very caught up in, in chasing numbers. Yes. And I, and I feel if they have a continuous trend, maybe, you know, that feeling will be a little bit le- lessened mm-hmm. um, and they feel more comfortable if we can see what way um, our baby's going. Are they targeting a higher or are they trending downwards? Right, exactly. And I think it can help really help clinicians do more like proactive care rather than reacting to, oh my gosh, our CO2 has jumped 20 points since our last blood gas. What are we going to do about this? It can really help you see, all right, are we just maintaining? Are we rising? Are we falling? So. Yeah. And especially now with all of the, um, you know, neuroprotective measures that Mm -hmm. we're trying to accomplish in our our micro preemie population, Mm -hmm. you you know, it's a lot easier if you can see a trend instead of having to go in there and do a hands-on lab draw or or whatever. Um, You know, you can even see if, hey, does my baby seem like we have an increased jump in CO2? Do I need a suction? Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, and Mm -hmm. that could really guide uh, a bedside nurse too uh, on their practices as well. Right, exactly. So how else does transcutaneous CO2 monitoring overcome some of our limits of blood draws or ABGs? Sure. So transcutaneous monitoring, the way we look at it is that there's a few different limitations to ABGs that we can help overcome. So things like blood loss, pain, um, an increased risk of infection, and then also time loss for the nurses, for the RTs when you're drawing a blood gas and then you're waiting to get the result. So transcutaneous monitoring helps to overcome all of those in different ways, um, with blood loss, I think, being one of the really main impactful ones. Yeah, and I know a lot of NICUs um, are really focusing in on how much blood we're taking mm-hmm. from these tiny babies um, and really trying to decrease the amount of blood draws total. Yeah, definitely. And we saw, so we've done a lot of research into what blood loss really looks like in a NICU. And we came across some literature that said that within the first six weeks of life, up to 30% of a neonate circulating blood volume is dropped for lab work each week, which is just really impactful. (laughs) (laughs) And we don't, I I don't think as nurses, we, you know, we don't think about that each time we're taking a heel stick because it doesn't seem like that much blood each time. No. But when you add it up and especially for these micro preemies, they don't really have that much blood volume to begin with. And I know it's trending to shy away from uh, blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. So if we Mm -hmm. can limit the amount of blood draws, you know, it eventually will limit the amount of blood transfusions that, you know, we need to do for these babies. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think one of the questions is, you know, what, what are we doing with all this blood? Like what kind of tests are we getting? Because sure, some things are super important, like our, you know, our blood cultures when they're first admitted or CBCs. Um, But some studies have shown that like, pH and blood gas monitoring are one of the highest drivers of blood draws in the NICU. So I think it's all about looking for ways that we can cut down on the unnecessary ones that maybe aren't necessarily guiding care, but maybe just reassuring the provider team that, okay, our CO2 is in in line, our pH is in line. And then you did mention um, pain Mm -hmm. and, you know, neuroprotection, neurodevelopmental care, like that's 
very, very important for, for these infants. And, you know, I think that's something that we also don't necessarily think of, you know, not just our micro preemie population, but our, our larger babies. Definitely. Um, because, you know, we might not have uh, access in order to draw blood and we do have to heal stick. So when we stick our babies all the time, I think that we focus a lot on like these um, non-pharmological uh, comfort measures. So we're, we're swaddling, we're hand-holding, we're you know, allowing them to suck on their pacifier. Um, and they, it may look like they're not really reacting to the pain, but we know that they get fluctuations in their heart rate, their sets might drop. Um, I remember, you know, having some babies who just totally bottom out when you stick them. Oh yeah. So, I mean, they do, they do react to it. And I think it's not only worrying about that painful event at that point, but it's looking into like the hours, the days, and now even like the weeks and years after that event. So there's been a lot of studies that show um, kind of a correlation and a connection between a lot of painful procedures early in life and then negative neurological outcomes. And I think some of the most impactful data is showing that it's not just, you know, within the first like eight to 12 months of a baby's life, but it's when they become school age children that we're seeing that their brains haven't developed as they should. Um, and they have all these negative neurological implications from painful procedures that maybe we didn't realize were impacting them. So, you know, not just even thinking about blood draws, but thinking about when we do like an eye exam, for example, or when we, um, you know, just do all these other stressful events or stressful um yeah, procedures on these babies, it really impacts them over the long haul. And then you did mention infection. And mm -hmm. I know that's a big focus um, mm -hmm. on, on every unit. Um, and, and so what do you think a benefit of um, the transcutaneous monitoring would be towards infection reduction, um, antibiotic stewardship, that's all, all things that we focus on every day? Definitely. I think that the more we can help people um, to not access their line. So, you know, you don't have to go in for that random ABG and access the arterial line, or you don't have to stick their heel when it's been stuck already 10 times. Um, that is only going to help them. So having that continuous value is really going to hopefully help providers think about, okay, is this really a necessary blood draw or can we live with this trend that we're seeing over time and see that it's stable? Um, because it's really, you know, collapses are super important to monitor in the NICU. I think that everyone is always kind of thinking about that, thinking about their number, because not only does that add to their length of stay um, and their cost of stay, but it can also lead to some poor outcomes for the baby. Yeah. And, you know, I think about the babies that you see with their heels all uh, macerated from Absolutely. the millions of sticks. And, you know, that's just an open source for infection mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. too, um, you know, for, um, for the babies that are, aren't fortunate enough to have a line. Um, and their skin's so fragile, and it's in a, you know, humidified environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a breeding ground for uh, bacteria, yeast, you know, all different forms of infection. Yeah. And you even hear about babies having sensitivity to their heels, you know, as they grow up and just, yeah, thinking about that and how we can decrease the amount of heel sticks that we're doing, I think is, is super important. And you're recognize. right. We do, we do focus on the here and now. Like, so, you know, my baby seemed to be comfortable during that heel stick because I gave him a pacifier or we swaddled or mom was holding during that procedure, but you don't think about the long-term effects that, mm -hmm. that you mentioned um, exactly. in the studies. Exactly. Yeah. So we, I mean, we really do think that transcutaneous monitoring can help you, yeah, decrease all of these ad, or the kind of the risk of all these adverse events that come along with ABGs and things that we don't necessarily think about all the time. So the things like the blood loss and how they're related to transfusions, um, your pain, and then the infection risk. So for the units that implemented uh, your technology, um, what results have you seen for decreased blood draws for these babies? Yeah, I think this is all part of a bigger picture of how, how units are trying to reduce blood draws. So we're thinking about um, how we can do strict protocols on minimum blood draw amounts or strict protocols on when we're drawing blood gases, um, using our bedside point of care testing so that we are sticking to those minimum values. And then implementing transcutaneous monitoring has been shown to really reduce the frequency of blood gases. So I think in one, um, in one high level NICU, you know, they were able to drop down their uh, blood gases on both their mechanically ventilated patients 
in their oscillatory ventilated patients um, by by 25%. And this was oh, wow. within kind of the first few months of monitoring. So still in that adjustment and transition phase. Like you said before, I don't think we realize just how much blood we're taking mm -hmm. uh, from these babies um, daily, mm -hmm. and especially within, like you mentioned earlier, the first uh, week of life, because mm -hmm. uh, there's so many adjustments that need to be done for uh, ventil ventilatory management and, and support. Yeah, and I think one other th other point is thinking about, okay, we're drawing all this blood, but are we really using all of it? And that comes back to that minimum, uh, you know, the minimum required values, but how much we actually wasting from from these patients when you know that can really add up over oh, time. Oh yeah, I, I know you're drawing a gas, and the you know the medical team is like, oh, just throw in a CBC, like you're already getting that. Mm -hmm. Well, do we mm -hmm. do we really need that? Exactly. And I think maybe if we really stop cutting back, or we start cutting back on our ABGs. Maybe that will stop them from wanting to add on a bunch of other uh, labs just because they feel as though, you know, we're, we're already accessing the line or we're right. already sticking. We might as well. Right. And it's like great that we can consolidate tests when possible um, so that we do decrease those uh, that line access. But yeah, I agree that if we can just decrease or stop the unnecessary testing altogether, that's only going to help benefit the patient. Exactly. And, and again, I, I can't stress enough just the neurodevelopmental aspect of, mm -hmm. of lab jaws and the, and the effects on these babies and, you know, with, especially with the micropemia population and some of your older kids with meconium aspiration, you know, the more you're touching them, it's just so detrimental mm -hmm. to, to these babies. You know, you think, oh, I'm just drawing this blood off this line, but you know, you're still disturbing them. They still, they still yeah. know you're, they still know you're there. So it's, you know, it's something that I feel as though if you had that technology, the transcutaneous, the trends are there. It's just, you know, it, I think it would give comfort to, um, you know, the medical team and, and the bedside yeah. nurse as well. And that's another good point that you made about kind of, you know, going in and touching these babies and stressing them out. Um, because one of the really important things that we focus on when we're implementing transcutaneous monitoring is how we can support the clustered care goals of the unit. So I mentioned before that there's a heated sensor. And of course, what this means is that it can't stay in one spot for over eight hours. Um, and sometimes we'll have people drop it down to four hours or maybe every six hours so that they will remove the sensor and change the site to coordinate with their care times. So you don't need to go in and bother the patient unnecessarily just because you have this monitor on. So it really we hope fits into the workflow for nurses and respiratory therapists in the NICU and helps support your cluster care goals. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's pretty much most units cluster care every six hours, four to six. So I mm -hmm. think that was, you know, that's perfect uh, timing mm -hmm. uh, for, for that. And, and you did mention about like nurse time, the time it takes to draw these mm -hmm. blood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some units don't have, um, instant uh, ABG results on their unit, it has to get sent to the lab. Right. And how many times does, you know, something happen in that process? Mm -hmm. Clots, mm -hmm. you know, they call and, you know, it's not accurate, quantity not enough, Yep. you know. Um, so I feel it takes away that level of frustration mm -hmm. um, for a bedside nurse and also the, you know, the team to make a decision because yeah. you're not going to be able to make that decision as quickly as you, you might want. Exactly, exactly. So after hearing about all the benefits of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, um, and you want to go to your unit and say, hey, I, I think that this is something that we need to implement and adopt in our unit. Can you kind of walk us through how um, one would do that, how you would bring that to um, your director, and how that process would be on your unit? Definitely. So I think people can really understand why why it's necessary, why it can be helpful. But again, it's another medical device that you bring into the unit and it's another monitor that everyone needs to worry about. So that can be um, kind of a big hurdle to overcome in terms of the education needed and just people accepting the device. And of course, the more that the people accept the device, the more they're gonna use it. So I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest goals of, you know, our sales team, our education and marketing team is really making sure that people understand why this device is here and how it can help them achieve some of their goals on the unit. So I think it's really important to focus on the benefits that we already talked about, like everything with blood loss and really tell people, you know, hey, we're trying to reduce the number of blood gases we do, and this device is going to help. I think that having that connection between that goal and this device will really help people understand, okay, like 
maybe we should start to use this. We can, you know, this is going to help us do that. And another thing that we really like to focus on is having a clinical champion or product champions on the unit, the people that really understand, you know, the ins and outs of the device, but also why we're using the device. So again, it all comes down to the why, but really making sure that's in place when we're um, implementing on the unit. I love the why. I think, and if you can find like a few nurses, the champions that you mentioned, they can really, you know, sell something to, to the staff. And yep. I think once they see the benefits of it, which is clear and obvious. And even if you present it as, hey, this is going to take away a lot of extra work on your part. And the frustration, I, I think just the frustration with dealing with the lab would be enough for right. some nurses <laughs> right. to be like, yeah, I love that. You know, I love that idea. And, and also, like we talked about earlier, the trend, the comfort, mm -hmm. and the fact that you're not having to do unnecessarily unnecessary blood draws for these babies um, is, you know, should be the why in of itself um, for most of these nurses. Yep. So then once we have kind of the, the buy-in from the team, I think the next big challenge is just educating people on how to use the device and really understanding who has ownership of what tasks. So I think it's going to vary between nursing and respiratory, who really owns the device and who owns sensor application or, you know, who is in charge of really understanding how the readings work and how to troubleshoot. So... I think that there's different levels of knowledge that we kind of target. We have our bedside users who are really the experts on how we interact between the patient and the device. Um, you have your super users who I think are common on every unit, but they really understand the device inside and out. They're kind of our go-to people for any questions. And then we need to think about, you know, the long-term maintenance and how we're going to keep this device up and running. So it's actually providing the values that you need um, when you need them. So... I think it's, one, important for the team to know their roles, and it's important that we structure our education to, um, to fit these roles. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, some units, the respiratory is, you know, who runs the show as far as any kind of ventilatory management and tidal CO2s, and they're really active um, in making those decisions. So, mm -hmm. you know, just to figure out in your unit, how does that work? Right. And we don't want it to be like, okay, this is respiratory only, so nurses hands off, because nurses are at the bedside all the time. So if something goes wrong with the device, they also need to be, you know, aware of, of what's going on, and they can't just, you know, wash their hands of it and say, well, that's respiratory's problem. Yes. <laughs> so it does really become collaborative when we're, when we're working with this kind of device, just like it is when we work with a ventilator or any other device that's kind of shared between those teams. Does the transcutaneous monitoring device, does that implement into um, a bigger monitor or in your electronic medical record, can that cross over? Yes. So our device connects with um, a variety of the patient monitoring systems that are pretty common in a lot of NICUs. Um, so what it lets you do is see either the value or the value in the trend, depending on the, the supplier. And this kind of helps because, I mean, as we know, there are so many devices at a patient's bedside. So sometimes that transcutaneous monitor might be pushed to the back. It might not be front and center. But if you can see that value on your patient monitoring screen with your heart rate, with your SpO2, that really brings it into the clinical picture a little bit more and helps providers keep track. That's excellent. Yeah. And it's a nice, quick visual that you can see where your where your baby is right and it, and it also again like that would help people that you know are like oh no not another device at the bedside yes. but it's integrated right on your monitor with all of your other important data that you need to be monitoring the whole time right so you finally have buy-in and you have the device on your unit how do you um, transition to accurately using that data on how you're treating and managing your babies that's a question we get a lot, and I think one of the other questions that goes along with it is how often do we need to draw blood gases to kind of correlate the value and make sure that we're that it's accurate? I think that's a huge thing in the beginning is how accurate is this device? And I think that it does take some teams a little bit longer to say, okay, we're going to start decreasing our blood draws because we know that this works. Um, so at the beginning, you may choose to track your blood gases and compare them to the transcutaneous readings. Um, you know, we have a correlation tracker that can help with that, that you can really look back and see, okay, here's the correlation between our capillary heel sticks, our arterial blood gases, and this transcutaneous monitor. 
And then over time, this will help your team identify issues. So if you are seeing correlation problems, you know, maybe your patient's lying on the sensor, which is going to cause false values. Um, so things like that, and then help you correct them early on. And then once your team develops that trust and sees that, okay, this value is accurate, we are comfortable with how to apply it and how it can monitor accurately, they can start to implement the changes in their practice, like reducing the number of routine blood gases. I like the correlation tracker because I think, you know, a lot of people are hesitant because of the um, non-correlation between the end titles mm -hmm. and the gases. So I think having that is um, very helpful um, in building that trust. Definitely. And sometimes, you know, we have a lot of a couple customers who will say the trend is your friend. So not kind of moving away from the value itself, but seeing how that trend goes over time. So if you are seeing that that trend is starting to increase, maybe that's an indication that, okay, we need to look at this patient. Is there any change in their clinical condition that we need to be attuned to? So I think we like to expand beyond just the value and really look at that trend over time. And that trend can be so useful for not just, you know, respiratory status, but hey, is this baby starting to get septic? Right. Um, right. You know, are there other issues that could be going on, neurological changes, because we have that yep. trend um, mm -hmm. that we can be monitoring at the bedside. Yeah. And it's all part of that clinical decision-making puzzle. So it's just another piece in that, um, and I think can really help providers uh, kind of indicate, okay, like or see what is going on with their patient and kind of add that to the to the picture. And, and you know, what provider or what NICU nurse doesn't like more data or numbers? Like, right. how, how can you argue, you know, just one more thing that you can have to give you a better clinical picture? Right. And like talking about that, you know, if your patient's CO2 is kind of all over the place between, you know, 8 a.m. and 12, 12 p.m. when you're doing the next blood gas, wouldn't you want to know that? Like, exactly. don't you want to see those changes over time? Uh-huh. I mean, how many times do you get a gas? And your baby was like acting fine, you thought, and then the gas is horrible. And right. you're like, this gas does not man match this baby's clinical picture. You know what? Now we have to dive deeper. And maybe mm -hmm. if you would have saw that trend a few hours ago, right? Things could have been addressed quicker. Exactly. Exactly. So it does really give you some uh, a lot more timely care that you can provide mm -hmm. for these babies. Can you give us an example of what teams that implemented this technology and had like amazing success with adoption and um, implementation? Sure, yeah. So the team at Hershey Medical Center um, at Penn State Health, I think they're a really good use case for how, you know, Things might not go well in the beginning, but you can implement strategies to make sure that you do adopt the, the technology fully. So they they originally had you know a few monitors on their unit, and the technology wasn't really being used all that much. I think they had issues with the correlation. Um, they also had some nurses who kind of remembered old versions of the technology where temperature was more of an issue. So there was just a lot of I don't want to say negative sentiment around monitoring, but just they didn't understand the true value of the technology. So what they did is really implement this standardized training program around transcutaneous monitoring. So educating people on you know the why, how it's used, um, and how the parameters support their care goals. So once they achieved this broad competency on how to use the device itself, um, they were really able to reduce their blood gases. And they told us that, you know, these are once around every four hours. Now they're every 12 hours. And then since then, they've actually spaced them out to once a day or even one to two times a week. So that's a pretty significant yeah. reduction. <laughs> but I think it goes to show that, you know, you they really had to have champions on their unit to take that device and take that technology and really push to make sure that everyone was on board, they knew how to use it, and that they were going to use it correctly. And I think once you see those results, I mm -hmm. mean, how can you not have buy-in? Right. Um, that was amazing. And it, it is a good success story because... You know, those challenges of trying to get buy-in and people remembering old technology, that's, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the biggest, you know, challenges you face when implementing anything new. Um, right. You have the traditionalists that don't want to, you know, have change. Yes. Yep. Exactly. We talked a lot about uh, transcutaneous CO2 monitoring as far as um, neurodevelopmental outcomes. 
units that try to incorporate transcutaneous monitoring in their protocols. Has that improved any neurodevelopmental outcomes? Have we have, do we have data on that or um, any success stories? Yeah, absolutely. So there was a study published by the team at UAB, and they were really focused on um, what they now call their Golden Week program. But this was a long study over a few years. And the real goal was to reduce the rates of um, ICH or death in the first week in their preterm infants. So obviously something that we're all <laughs> invested in. Um, so, you know, their care bundle covered a lot of things like respiratory support, thermoregulation, nutrition and fluid management, infection prevention, and neurological status, of course. So really a multi-parameter, multi-disciplinary um, uh, care bundle. But what was interesting is that one of the interventions that they implemented upon admission was starting transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. And what this allowed them to do was really target their goal CO2 range. And that targeting really improved once they implemented transcutaneous monitoring. Um, and also to avoid those large fluctuations in CO2, which we know increase the, race, uh, the risk for IVH. So I think having this implemented into the care bundle really shows how transcutaneous monitoring can be used. And I mean, not just to mention the benefits, but once it's in the bundle, then people know when we're going to use it. Okay, this baby's coming in, they meet these criteria, we're going to implement transcutaneous monitoring right when they get here. Yeah, it's just part of the workflow. Exactly. And I think that really, really helps with the implementation of the device is understanding on what patients are using it, when do we put it on. Um, so writing down these protocols, clinical guidelines, however you, your, your unit calls them, I think is really helpful for all the team to become a lot more involved with transcutaneous monitoring. And it just becomes part of your care. And it's not just something in the periphery. It's just something that's actively being used um, to care exactly. for the babies. So after hearing all of the success stories and you're interested in trying to bring transcutaneous CO2 monitoring to your unit, where can we go for the next step? Absolutely. So our website is really the best way to um, find us and contact us. So it's just sentech.com. And then there you can learn all about transcutaneous monitoring. You can see everything that we offer. Um, but if you have people on your team that want to learn more, if you, or if you yourself want to learn more, we do webinars pretty regularly on the benefits of CO2 monitoring in the NICU. So you can hear from my colleagues on you know, all the different things that we've talked about just a little bit more in depth and how transcutaneous monitoring can help. So I really think that's the best way to help yourself and your team learn more about it is our continuing education webinars. Well, thank you, Chelsea, for joining us today. And thank you for Sentech. Um, I think everybody will be going to your website definitely to get this information if you don't have that on your unit, because how can you not? It just seems like such a benefit to not only uh, the nurses, the clinical staff, but also most importantly, our tiny babies. So Absolutely. Thank you. thank you so much, Jill. I would like to thank our sponsor, Sentech. This podcast would not be possible without their support. Make sure you never miss an episode of Nancast by subscribing now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks for your support and letting us into your ears. Have a great day.